Welcome back into another edition of the KSO Show. Mason Vogt, Derek Young with you as we get set on this Wednesday to go over everything that the head man for the Wildcats said in his Tuesday press conference. Chris Kleiman talking to the media after the Wildcats 44-31 win over UCF. I always appreciate that K-State does their media stuff on Tuesdays as opposed to Mondays like some do because I always wonder – so close to the game, what can you really get that you didn't get after the game? I think this is about NFL teams too. Like NFL teams that played on Sunday and then Monday afternoon, the coaches are in the building and they're talking to people. It's like, well, what has changed that you're going to learn from this? So you get a little bit of an extra cushion there with Chris Kleiman. He comes in, he's got the full perspective. Maybe we all have the full perspective now, or we think we do. Uh, and we go in there, we grill him, and uh, we get out of there. And I'm sure a lot of people are thinking, I've listened to Chris Kleiman press conferences. He does not get grilled by uh, by the K State media, but uh, that's you know that's that's for everybody else to decide. Uh, what was the number one takeaway from Chris Kleiman's comments on uh, Tuesday for you, Dy? Yeah, going back to what you're saying, it was definitely a bye week crowd in, in veneer too. Mm-hmm. There was like I want to say seven or eight of us tops. So. Um, yes. I think we got in and out in probably a shorter time than, than we typically do. Um, still got our lunch, so that's good. You know, what was missing in that intro, and you said you have, is the random Platner tackle. Um, because Chris Kleiman actually touched on that because he, he joked with random Platner, the long snapper, because he was one of the few that was not tricked by the whole punt return formation, the trick play that UCF tried to deploy. And, and maybe it goes for a good chunk there, 15 or 20 yards, if not for Raina Platner, who was not, who sniffed it out the entire time, which if you know him or know of him, that probably doesn't surprise you. But Kleiman said he joked with him. He's like, hey, it's your first big time tackle of your entire career. Um, <laughs> obviously, for a long snapper, that's not surprising. He said, Platner said, whoa, 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 no, no, no. I had one last year against Iowa State, too. So don't remember that well. myself. Hey, look at this. Look at who's on top of it right here. I I have the video right here for you. Uh, if you're watching it, you can see it in action on the YouTube. If you're listening, DY is getting a look right now at the punt return that was mentioned and what took place with it. And Raiden Platner and it looks like Bo Palmer were very much the only two that knew <laughs> that that trick play was unfolding. So, uh, yeah, yeah, you got a little random Platner action uh, with the tackle um, and big play there that he that he had go on. So, um, yeah, no, that was that was good for for what took place for for the Wildcats there. But, um, you know, one thing that I, I took away from what Chris Kleiman said on Tuesday, you know, we're trying to figure out everything that's going on. He talked a little bit about uh, injuries and getting some guys back and. Of importance, there were three pass catchers that came up in this. R.J. Garcia, who played a little bit in the game, but not even a noticeable amount, was dinged up. Seems like he'll be ready and good to go by the time they face Oklahoma State. And then there was the hope that Keegan Johnson and Garrett Oakley would be at the level that they want those guys to be at when they are able to go to Stillwater. Maybe getting the type of player that they expected to have that they really haven't seen through the first four weeks of the season. And why I bring that up and why it's so interesting to me is because as we've talked about, uh, you know, my my player grades on the the last episode of the KSO show and and where some people fall on those is, look, I I think Will Howard and the receivers both deserve some blame for the misconnections on on Saturday against UCF. Like, yes, Will Howard could have been a little bit better, probably could have been a little bit sharper. Um, There is no there is no doubt about that in my eyes. But what I go in there and see with the way things work out is I think there's an element to to this that's on the coaching staff, too, because you're the ones that are putting the players on this team. And I was interested in in looking at this because it feels like K-State has some of the smaller receivers in the Big 12. Here's a little here's a little fact for you, D.Y. Average height of the top four receivers on each Big 12 team. So. I went through, and if you were a wide receiver, I took the top four guys in terms of production so far this season, and I took the average height of those players. Uh, Any guesses on who has the the tallest receivers in the Big 12 right now? Probably Texas or Oklahoma. 
Uh, Texas and Oklahoma, fifth and sixth. Um, if you want to be technical, Texas is tied for third on the average base. Houston is number one of all teams at 74.25 inches. Uh, so that works out to averaging. Their receivers are, again, on average, 6'2 or taller. Uh, the way that that works out. A little over 6'2 is the average. KU is second on the list. They're at 73.75 inches, so they're just under that. And that would make sense to a lot of people that have seen KU. They've got some pretty tall receivers. You have to go all the way down to the bottom and find the Wildcats. They are dead last in average height of receivers at 71.25. Um, so, I mean, the way that works out, K-State and TCU are the only two teams in the Big 12 that their top four receivers are, on average, under six foot. And K-State also is one of only four teams to have a, a top four receiver that is under 5'10", obviously that being Phillip Brooks, and he is their leading receiver out of the wideouts. So when you think about the throws that Will Howard is having to make to some of these guys, he doesn't have the luxury of the size of target that others have. I mean, honestly, that's probably why his connection with Ben Sennett is so strong. That's his biggest target out there that he can hit. Sennett has the reach to make some more plays there's a little bit more wiggle room for where that ball is going. Now, it's not always the same type of, of route and, and movement that the receivers are having, but a throw can be a little bit offline. It doesn't have to be so precise, where that's kind of the thing with like the Jaden Jackson stuff that took place down the field. That ball had to be precise. There was a ball to Phillip Brooks early in the game to the corner of the end zone that like maybe should have had it, but it, that ball has to be right on the money to get a ball to Phillip Brooks in the end zone because he's 5'8". He's, he is the shortest of the contributing receivers in the Big 12 currently. Uh, Brennan Presley at o, o State is also 5'8". But then there's only two other guys that are below 5'10". So that is something that is interesting to me. And I think, uh, you know, K-State needs to find a way to get these receivers more involved, find a way to get them open more because you can throw them open but once they get that tiny bit of separation, there is a much lesser chance that the Wildcats are going to have success throwing the ball than other teams in the league. Because say you are Quinn Ewers and you're throwing to somebody like Xavier Worthy or you know whoever else on their team. I think Texas's tallest receiver is uh, Adonai Mitchell, who's who comes in at 6'4". You've got a little bit more room for air if you're Quinn Ewers throwing a little touchy ball to, to Mitchell than Will Howard does if he's going to Phillip Brooks. Um, same type of deal if you're, you're Jalen Daniels and you're throwing to Quentin Skinner, who's 6'5". Like, all these other guys seem to have options. The options for, for K-State, their tallest receiver that they put on the field right now is Jaden Jackson. Yeah, I mean, having a bit larger catch radius always makes things a little bit easier for a quarterback. That's why, you know, NFL teams look for that, and it's, it's part of the assessment when you're looking at hand sizes and height and all that when it comes to catch radius – in terms of like a combine type thing. It's it's something that is measured because it is important. At the same time, there is, that's part of it. I think uh, it's a good point to raise. Something that I probably glossed over and maybe I shouldn't have. At the same time, there is also cases where there is enough separation for Will Howard to connect on and it isn't happening just yet. And there, there was a couple of times where I think he had a guy where he, he's been overthrowing them by a touch is what it seems like the most. And some of that could also be like, hey, well, let's let's get some better ball skills in here. And some of that is, you know, we'd rather underthrow a guy than overthrow a guy. And you got to be you got to be co conscious of that if you're Will Howard. The Garrett Oakley one along the east sideline comes to mind in that regard mm -hmm. um, when he's running all alone. So there's multiple culprits of this issue. And it just comes down to everyone just being a tick off. And you would think with more time, they'll get that tick on. You know what I mean? So I, I'm not terrified about it, but it is something that needs to be addressed. And it is correctable because there, there are opp opportunities there. The receivers are pro producing some of those opportunities. Their consistency also isn't there. And not, not, not just from a vertical yeah. standpoint, but we're talking about the Chris Kleiman press conference, and you mentioned we need to get some of these guys maybe more of a free release. That's because they're not winning at the top of the route. They're not winning off the line of scrimmage. Some of these guys, because of size, to your point, 
are getting roughed up a little bit at the line of scrimmage, not getting off the ball well enough. A quarter could be really physical. They had that problem against Missouri. Uh, you get man coverage, and some of those Missouri corners were bigger, uh, faster, stronger, were just able to get into them and knock them off the route. So then you're not running a precise route where your timing is affected too because there isn't that physicality or strength that they need at the position. They're, they are probably lacking that component. So I, I thought that was actually one of the more no, a seminal, well, a critical moment when Chris Klein said we need some free releases because I think that is at least acknowledging that maybe at the line of scrimmage there are some things that aren't going well. And, and that's kind of what I what, what you know I, I was trying to get at too with with what I think of the receivers is there are things that need to be done for them to be in a position where they are more open. Like yes, by by what we expect of of good quarterbacks, Jaden Jackson was open, Philip Brooks was open. Some of these guys were open on Saturday, but it wasn't to the extent that we see with a lot of other teams in the Big Twelve to this point this year, where there is you know. More, there's plenty of room of separation. It's not just, okay, you, you got by him a little bit. Will Howard has to drop this ball in the bucket here. You know, get, give Will Howard a barrel to drop the ball in, not a bucket to drop it in. And you look at what K-State did, like they only had one play to a receiver that went more than 15 yards on Saturday. 16-yard pass to Seth Porter. Um, that's not an, another 5'8 guy. That's not going to get the job done. Every other play – through the air that went more than 15 yards on Saturday for K-State, 22 to Ben Sennett, 24 to DJ Giddens, 22 to DJ Giddens, and 16 to DJ Giddens. So it's not, it's not great. And I think that's why Chris Kleiman is, is looking at it, and he knows that this team is going to need to have plays down the field to have success as they move forward because not only is it just something that you need to have in your repertoire, but you also are going to need to be able to have those types of plays for momentum, to score quickly, because you are going to come to a point where you can't just always say, hey, we're going to you know, take as much time as we need to get down the field. We can't always have an 11-play drive to score a touchdown. Sometimes we're going to need to do it in three or four plays. And to your point, like nothing there even got to 20 yards. And, and when it got close to it, or, or maybe it did get over 20 yards, yards after the catch were, were a pretty big um, characteristic of that. So – Yes, there, there. We saw the two or three that Will Howard missed, but that's two or three. And how many balls did he throw? Right. Um, yeah, he, I mean, threw, he, he threw, threw forty-two passes and he yeah. had fifteen incompletions. Yeah, so there's eighty-two freaking eighty-two freaking plays for Kansas State. He threw forty-two passes. We're cap, we're sealing out the two or three that he probably missed on the one to Oakley, the one to Jackson, maybe the one to Brooks. I get it. That's three of the forty-two. There's fifteen incomplete passes. There's, I mean, if you only have two or three chances at those to get vertical, then you, you then your receivers and tight ends probably aren't doing enough too. Yeah, yep. We'll uh, we'll have to see kind of where things uh, end up going on and, and how it happens. Um, I know real quick just to, to shout it out on here. Um, you know, freak on KSU under KSU freak on the message board. He was going through and he was like charting the misses and he was trying to go through and like, okay, here's where you can kind of put it down and, and how you try and and. And I think that's the way you have to do it. Like, it's all case by case. There are throws that Will missed, but also go and look at the, the throws that he did make in the game. And I think that's something that gets overlooked. Because they yep. weren't the big plays that went 25 yards for a touchdown, he threw some really tight balls, and, and they were really good to pick up first downs or keep a drive alive. Tight, there was a really some really nice tight window throws. Uh, he made the correct decision on all the read action plays, whether to give or take. He probably got them out of – I can remember when I was watching probably out of six or seven bad plays and two good ones. I think two of them went for touchdown. So there's a lot that maybe the, and not to like insult anyone's intelligence to hear, but there's a lot that maybe mm-hmm. an average fan doesn't see that Will Howard is doing as well. That That is very conducive to winning football. But, and this is what we have, because the, the pass explosiveness on defense – is not great for the Wildcats in their favor. Pass explosive on offense is not great for Kansas State in their favor. This is probably the the microcosm of it all. And by the way, both sides correctable, fixable. I think they're going to get there and be fine. It's going to take some time. UCF average yards of completion 
almost 19. 19 yards of completion almost. Yep. It was 18.9. Kansas State, 9.4. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's – it's. I don't now, know. If, Will, if Will Howard hits two or three ways that we're talking about, yeah, that, that yeah. number goes up. But guess what? You can't – I mean, Quinn Ewers is not 100% on every deep ball. They're deep balls. They're harder to connect on. Yeah. Now, there's a few that there's enough separation there and need, they need to be connected. I get it, but you need to have more than two or three chances too. Yeah. And part of it would be the hope that some of this stuff evens out and that this you just, you know, Milwaukee healthy. Healthy early. Yeah. Yeah. You get Keegan Johnson healthy. You see what happens because right now, I mean, you are basically relying on Phillip Brooks to be your number one receiver. And that's just not the type of guy he's ever going to be like, you know, the deep balls down the field. It's not his thing. And so you need Keegan Johnson to be that guy. We'll wait and see if, if he ends up uh, being healthy enough to actually do that and if he can execute when he does get to that health. All right, moving on uh, to some of the other things that, that Chris Kleiman mentioned. Uh, he did also bring up Treshawn Ward and his injury status. Uh, he should be good to go by the Oklahoma State game, it sounds like. Um, any other really notable things off the top that were like headline news that Chris Kleiman had to say today uh, in his press conference? Treshawn Ward back, RJ Garcia back. I thought, and this is me being essentially reading body language and being like a, a psychologist in that and, and, and tone and everything. So this is pure speculation. I thought he sounded the most upbeat and I guess positive about the Keegan Johnson situation in a while. That was my my assessment. That's probably good. I mean, we saw a lot more Keegan Johnson. We saw him earlier in the game uh, on Saturday. They, you know, they, they tried to get him involved. And so I think with that time off, there's reason to be optimistic about what he can do and, and go out and accomplish against Oklahoma State, which, you know, I, I keep bringing it up. And this is probably why uh, Chris Kleiman is also optimistic about it. Like, if you look back at what happened this weekend, Oklahoma State let Rocco Beck throw the ball as well as he's ever done and probably as well as he ever will do at least this season, because Beck had not been very good for Iowa state as the season went on. Now he's a freshman, but here, here's what Rocco Beck did in the first handful of games of the year, 10 of 13 for 113 against Northern Iowa, 23 of 44, 203 yards against uh, Iowa, 17 of 24 for 233, two picks against Ohio, but then against Oklahoma state, he goes 27 of 38, 348 yards, and three touchdowns in the game. Uh, Iowa State was able to, to throw the ball around and put up some points on Oklahoma State, and that's not typically something that you do. And the Cyclones had uh, three different receivers have plays of 20 yards or greater, including Jalen Noel, who had 38, had a long of 38 yards, and then Daniel Jackson had a 29-yard grab. So there is the opportunity for some downfield work against this Oklahoma State defense that K-State's going to face coming out of the bye week? I asked Chris Kleiman the question, and, and I think it's a fair thing to understand here, too, that could be toying a little bit with the pass offense when it comes to explosiveness. And, and I still don't think it's as simple as saying Bill Howard's not good enough. I, I think I don't think he's been great at it, but I don't think he's had a lot of help. Is that I do tend to think that things got a little turned upside down on him because – they basically assembled an offense and a plan on that side of the ball throughout the entire offseason that were going to be centralized on considerable roles for guys like Garrett Oakley, who I think was going to play a considerable role in a double tight kind of situation with Ben Sinnott, but also Keegan Johnson is the number one receiver and probably the guy that can stretch the field the best out of everyone in the receiver room. And then, you know, a few days before the season, you find out that you're not going to have those two. So, I still think that's been a limiting factor in all of this. And to put a bow on it, I will also say as much as we're picking nits, and I, and I think it's fair to call that in some cases, or saying we want this to be perfect, we want this to be perfect, and we want this to be perfect, just basically demanding perfection from every facet of the Kansas State offense, I think it's fair to understand that like they're the number 13 offense in the country. So if it looks like this and they're still that good, I, I think there's worse places to be. 
Yeah. And uh, I mean, a lot of this is going to be you're coming off of a Big 12 title. You bring back the quarterback, the offensive line, uh, you know, one of the receivers and then some other players that helped you do that. The expectations are high and what people think of you are going to be graded on a much different curve now. We'll see kind of what K-State does to adjust. Uh, Special teams, we already talked about uh, Randon Plattner and his uh, phenomenal play uh, earlier. That might have been the only one. (laughs) Yeah, that might have been the only one. Uh, What what kind of vibe did you get from Chris Kleiman when it came to discussing special teams on Tuesday? His his tolerance is shortening there, Yeah, which is fair. I mean, yeah. That's the, uh, that's a kind of special teams performance that eventually cost you. Football coaches don't like to have to go in and talk about kickers. Uh, no, I, I don't, don't want to talk about a kicker. Don't you know what? Look, I and mean, this might piss some people off because they probably want him to be the most pissed about the kicker. But really, really, what he's seen the most pissed off about were the holding penalties, which I thought the yeah. one was kind of bullshit. But he seemed to think it was a good call. Yeah. Uh, well, that and and also, obviously, I think, you know, another th- area of concern is the amount of yards being given up on some of the opponent returns is is a concern moving forward for K-State. Just, you know, it, when the defense is is struggling at times, especially in the secondary, what you can't do is instead of letting the team start at the 25, letting them move that thing up a little bit more. Or, I mean, same thing goes for the kicks out of bounds. Like, we've seen a couple of those already this year. So, I don't know, just – just things you're, to kind of yeah. keep in mind. Look, I'm not – I don't kick, so maybe I'm not in a place to say how easy it is. But we know Chris Tennant has a massive freaking leg. Boot the damn thing in the end zone and call it a day. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably, you know, just throw them at the 25, whatever. Call it call it good, especially since that's the likely outcome in a lot of scenarios unless you give them an opportunity. Uh, what else from Chris Kleiman w- was notable in your eyes and, and needs mentioned before we, we move on? Yeah, I mean, it seems like we probably covered it for the most part. I mean, the, the last two weeks from Chris Kleiman have not been the most enlightening experiences. Like, there hasn't been a whole lot to hit on. And this is kind of what happens when you get into, like, the flow of uh, a season and you have a Definitely. team that the glaring weaknesses are what they are. They are glaring. You know, he could go out there and I, you know, and he kind of did say that they need to be better with some of the downfield stuff. But are you really going to criticize Will Howard after how he played? Because there are a lot bigger fish to fry. Um, you certainly can't say anything about the the running backs. The offensive line played better, probably their best game of the season on Saturday. So it's it's dwindling down the things that you can really get a lot of good information out of. It's either injuries or the big things that you're not doing well. And he did talk about the defense and, again, brought up, you know, the same thing. It's like they got to be more disciplined with their eyes when they're out there. Um, That's what happened on the trick play and some other things. They just, you know, and that's something that comes with experience for a bunch of young guys that either are young enough that they're freshmen or sophomores or have never really played power five football before. Yeah, and obviously that's guys like Marquis Siegel, Will Lee, who are transfers, junior college transfers that haven't played power five football, haven't you know, put on a Kansas State uniform until this year, really. So they're dealing dealing with some of that. I think they're f- moving some pieces around, feeling, feeling it out. Um, but again, I said this, I think, on would be yesterday's show. At the end of the day, like, there were moments in that UCF game that make you pull your hair out. But when you reflect and look at the totality of the performance, it actually wasn't bad. Yeah. No, I would agree. I would agree with that. Uh, you you look around, and this is a team that, with all the flaws, they are still in good shape. You just got to correct some things to make sure you're in even better shape and you're in the right kind of shape that you want to be in to actually compete uh, with, you know, basically Texas right now. Like, we've identified Texas is easily the one that you have to – that you're chasing, basically. Everybody else is kind of in this same group, depending on what tier of the Big 12 you're in. You're either Texas – or the group right below that could really do something. Some teams that, hey, they're not bad, but they're also not good. And then the teams that, yeah, you are bad. And uh, right, right now, unfortunately, the Big 12 has a lot of teams that are in the, yeah, you are bad category. Yeah, the, yeah, you are bad category being Oklahoma State, Houston, Baylor, 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 Baylor Iowa State, Houston. Those four. And, 
and Texas Tech is on the fringe right now. Tech I, needs I, to I, do I, 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 I'm still holding out hope for Texas Tech. They're in the not good, not bad category with like BYU. Yeah. Um, and I guess Cincinnati. Yeah. 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 Cincinnati. Cincinnati has some room to UCF. fall into that. Yeah. You're bad category. Yeah. Cincinnati. UCF. I would say Cincinnati, Texas Tech, BYU. It's, yeah. It's basically Tech and three of the four newcomers. Yeah. UCF. UCF is probably like the leader of the middle of the pack there. The, you're not good. You're not bad. You know, they're, they're probably the one that could move up a tier uh, see, out of those guys. Yeah. It's tech and three of the four newcomers. And then that second tier that like you're good, but you're not Texas. That's like Oklahoma, K state, TCU and KU. Yeah. Yeah. Looking at it. Yeah. And Hey, congrats to West Virginia for, for moving oh, up on actually, game. yeah, West Virginia's probably right there with BYU, UCF, Cincinnati, and Tech. Yeah, and they beat no. Tech. So. <laughs> Give them some props. Uh, also, real quick, I brought up uh, my receiver research earlier. You want to know my favorite name in out of Big 12 receivers that I came across? Uh, he plays for Houston. Uh, his name is Joseph Manjack IV. Joseph Manjack IV. Okay, I'm, I'm a fan. Hopefully. So it starts <laughs> – it starts slow with Joseph, but it ends very strong with Manjack the fourth. That's uh, impressive to say the least. Oh, to begin the year was Neil Brown hot seat. Now, probably still hot seat, but uh, <laughs> Morgantown, he he probably doesn't have to. I don't. I don't think he needs a realtor yet. Uh, honestly, the way that it probably is is. <laughs> is uh, he's no longer on a very hot seat. And instead, Ren Baker, the West Virginia AD, is probably on the hot seat. You know, he just got brought in, what, like the, the end of last year. So every AD wants to hire their own football coach. And he's probably thinking he was going to be able to fire this guy. West Virginia fans probably still want Neil Brown to be fired because they probably don't have the confidence that he can get them to, like, a Chris Kleiman level. But <laughs> – it's probably really tough for Rim Baker right now because he's like, yeah, you know, if we get any more success, successful, I may not fire this guy. And if you look at what's left on their schedule, they play at Houston. They play at home against Oklahoma State, home against BYU, and home against Cincinnati. That is four very winnable games right there for West Virginia. I mean, they could get to seven wins, and that's not including a road game at Baylor, and then the other games left are at Oklahoma at UCF and at TCU. A legitimate chance that, that West Virginia wins seven games this year. In he fact, could, book it. Seven wins, West Virginia. It's happening. He could do – now, I don't really – I'm not a proponent of this because it, it's a kind of a cowardly um, thing to do and, uh, yeah, shady in, in, in some respects. But the Kirby Hocut thing where yeah. – he fired Matt Wells before he could win too many games. I think they were like four yeah. and two or three and two. He's like, nope. You're they went done. to a bowl game. They went to a bowl game. Yeah, but uh, nobody fired him in the season. Yeah. Before Matt Wells could get credit for those wins to put them in a bowl game. So it's like if West Virginia yeah. loses the next game, falls to three and two, Ren Baker's like, okay, you're fired at three and two. Because that's basically what Kirby Hocutt did to Matt Wells. Yeah. Uh well, it was after the K-State game. They they yeah. got beat. Uh Texas still Tech was still had a winning record at that point. Texas Tech was five and three when they fired Matt Wells. Uh, that team Look, went on to beat Mississippi State thirty-four to seven in the Liberty Bowl and won seven games uh, that season. Because so does Red Baker does he yeah. capitalize off of a random West Virginia loss during the year? Like that's it. That was the straw that broke the camel. Yeah, back. I I would say if boy, it's going to be tough though because. Over their next three games, I realistically think that they probably go two and one. So they're probably sitting at six and two. And can, can you fire him if he drops to six and three after a loss at UCF? That or honestly, you could maybe get away with if they get blown out at Oklahoma or something. That's the tenth game of the year, so that might be the one to watch. But I'm looking at this. Uh, Matt Wells got fired after uh, the the loss to K State. Uh, that dropped them down. They beat. They got beat by one point 
to the Wildcats. Uh, <laughs> and we all remember that one. That was the Felix uh, and Unike Uzoma, uh, Uzuma, or uh, whatever Tim Brando wanted to say uh, in the game. That was the sack game for Felix. Uh, yeah. Also, <laughs> that was uh, – is that Cooper Beebe from Spencer Tillman uh, when it was Tyrone Tolini on the defensive side of the ball? That was uh, also it. And I'll give you another Texas Tech memory. They also fired Cliff Kingsbury after losing to Kansas State. Oh, well, there you go. Uh, the, and bad news for, for Rim Baker, the Grim Reaper, Chris Kleiman, is not on the schedule this year for, uh, for Wait, West Virginia. So he doesn't even get Bill that. Snyder. I think it was Bill Snyder, right? It would have been for Kingsbury. Yeah, Snyder, Snyder got uh, Cliff, Cliff Kingsbury. Uh, but climate, well, climate had that stretch though, where he got Matt Wells. Uh, he got, who else was it that he got Did in he there? Get Gary like, Patterson? Yes. He got Gary Patterson. <laughs> and then uh, they, there was somebody else they beat. It didn't come immediately after the game, but it, it certainly seemed like it was going to happen. Um, yeah. I don't know. It's, it's wild. I mean, the losses were not very good. I will say that, that uh, Matt <laughs> Wells had accrued. They got beat by 35 to Texas, 70 to 35, and 52 to 31 by TCU. And then they blew that game against K State. So, was David Beatty? Did they get David Beatty, maybe? Mm, uh, well, no, because David Beatty, he got fired before the K State game in 2018. And they still let him coach it. And he coached scared. He coached like a guy that hadn't lost his job yet. He had nothing to lose in that game. And he coached scared. Maybe it was Les Miles. I, th- I was thinking maybe you got a KU coach. I don't well, know. Well, Les got fired in the offseason, though, because he was he was a naughty, oh, yeah. naughty boy down in, in Baton Rouge. So I don't, <laughs> well, I don't really know. I can't, I, of, I can't think of who else it would have been because, I mean, Gundy hasn't – the last time he was in a coach at Oklahoma State was when you were in diapers. I tell you what, if, if something bad happens – uh, on next Friday in Stillwater, it, he, Gundy would not get fired like that, but it might be the the like final straw. It's like, okay, we have to address a problem here. Like, you know, y- you have some things in life where you have issues and you kind of keep like saying, hey, we need to monitor this. Like, this isn't very good. Like, we need to do something to change this. But you don't really have that big moment yet until something really major happens. And it's like, okay, we can't avoid talking about this anymore. We have to have this conversation. If K State goes to Stillwater and wins that game like 35 to 7 or 35 to 3, it's probably the time for you know everybody in Stillwater to look around and say, Mike, uh, I, this isn't looking good. And we might have to, we we might have to think about parting ways with you. So there you I- go. I don't know if I'd be there yet. I don't. I know that sounds crazy, but like. I just think the writing's on the wall. Maybe, but after the 2021 season, like they almost went to the freaking playoff. (laughs) Yeah, but the the world has changed since then, I think, uh, in a significant way. And if there's one guy that seems like he's not up to the task to adjust to the new the new world we live in, it is Mike Gundy. I don't know. We'll see. He he always pulls a rabbit out of his hat. Won't be an easy one for K-State. And uh, that all will be a topic of conversation next week as we get closer to K-State and Oklahoma State. But what we have on tap for you the rest of the week, even though there isn't a game for the Wildcats, we will be back on the YouTube and podcast platforms on Thursday. We'll discuss our Big 12 power rankings as we are one-third of the way through the season. And then on Friday, D.Y. and I will be back. We'll have some best bets. We'll look at the rest of the Big 12 and uh, kind of where that that leaves things moving forward for K-State. And then a normal Sunday show. And uh, then we'll be back, you know, all next week, getting ready for the Cats and the Pokes. But that will do it for D.Y. and I here today. Thanks for joining us on K-State Online. Be sure to get subscribed to the YouTube and podcast platforms. And if you are not joining us over on On3 with all the great written work at K-State Online and access to the premium message boards, you are missing out because there's a lot of great things that go on there. A lot that has to do with K-State, some that doesn't have to do with K-State, but it still may catch your eye. So uh, be sure in any way that you can or want to be a part of K-State Online, and we will be back with more content for you here on Thursday.